Good morning, Meadowbrook. Really good to see everybody. Um, it was back in 2016, I was running, did this duathlon thing, so it's like a triathlon, except for you don't have to swim, which is great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was a little bit simpler, right? So three miles at the front end of running, 21 miles of biking, and then a three-mile run at the end, right? So for some of you are like, that's nothing. For some of you, you're like, yeah, I never do that. But we did it. And um, I was doing great until the bike ride, right? I, like, I, I'm, I talked about running a couple weeks ago. I can run fast if I force myself to, right? So I was in first place after the first three miles. But I am not like a biker. I'm not one of those people who like, goes to the coffee shop who's like a serious biker on Saturday mornings. You guys see those people? Like totally decked out in all their bike gear. Like, that's, that's not me. I, I like biking, but I just like, I do it to get around town. Like, if I have the option to, to drive somewhere or bike somewhere, I'll just bike somewhere just because I enjoy it. So I'm, I'm that kind of biker. So I got done uh, in the race uh, with my run, and I jumped onto my Fuji Palisade. Now, this is not the best uh, image of the Palisade, but it at least gives you a little idea. That's my oldest son, Titus, back when he was just a little baby. Uh, but the Fuji Palisade, this bike, it's a cool bike. Uh, on the one hand, I really like the Fuji Palisade. Uh, I love the color. I love the look of this bike. But it's like one of those heavy steel frame, like mid-90s bicycle. You know what I mean? And so I bought it for $100 on the last day of college. I had an acquaintance who would take old bikes and fix them up and then sell them off. And so I, it's probably like one of the best hundred dollars I've ever spent because I've gone like probably thousands of miles on this bike. But, but the thing is that we've been meaning for a decade to get a new bike. It's like the thing is just heavy. Like it's kind of slow. Um, the handlebars currently are like this from the wheel. So I'm like going like this to go straight. You know, it's just kind of like it needs a lot of work in general. So every year we're like, are we going to buy a new bike? And every year it's like, Probably not, because it's going to cost some money. Well, even back in 2016, I knew I had a limitation with my bike. I knew I could, I could run the race, but that I would be jumping onto this old bike. So I did the three miles of running. I'm doing well. I'm in first place. Everybody else, after they run, takes off their shoes and puts on different shoes for biking. Not me, right? I just jump right onto my bike. I'm just like, yep, I don't need to do that at all. I'm saving time. I'm getting right onto my bike. Uh, but I had to rely on this vehicle, right? This thing that's getting me around. And uh, when I started biking, I was feeling fine in first place. Uh, within five minutes, uh, the real bikers started passing me, right? And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Like these athletic real bikers. Yeah, a couple minutes later, less athletic people start passing me, right? A <laughs> uh, couple minutes later, Teenagers start passing me. Uh, men start passing me. Women are passing me. Like, it doesn't matter. Everybody's passing me on the bike. And I was pumping hard. I think I was almost going 20 miles per hour, but the bike just, it was such a limitation. And um, for me, you know, the bike was fine for getting to a coffee shop. It was not fine for winning a race. And the reality with my biking is that if I really wanted to, I could go out and buy a better bike, and I would perform a heck of a lot better. The deeper reality uh, for you and for me is that all too often we use all kinds of vehicles in the vast aspects of our life to get us to where we want to go, right? So think about it. So think about your, your body. Your body is like a vehicle. It can get you from place to place. It can get you to where it is that you're going. There's stuff about your body that you can change and you can control, but there's stuff about your body that you can't. It's just like your genetics. It's just kind of what you're stuck with. But we, we use all kinds of other vehicles as well for operating in the world. Uh, we use and we trust all kinds of things to fulfill our daily needs. So like, think about like department stores. They're a vehicle that brings you all of your daily needs, right? They like bring it to you. And so we trust them to pr provide for our daily needs. They, our daily needs, they, we use them to get these many things. And you probably have a particular department store that you trust, right? Like you go to the same one again and again because they deliver the thing that you're looking for. So it's the brands that we buy, right? We trust them, but it's also the money that we spend. So here's some money. We put, yeah, it's a $10 bill. 
real fancy. We put trust in this money. This piece of paper, we trust that it means something, right? This stuff used to be backed up by actual gold, right? You could like go to Fort Knox, theoretically, and there'd be $10 of gold uh, that would back this up. Not so much anymore. But the world has collectively agreed that the American dollar is trustworthy, right? That it's the most reliable vehicle of currency. So underneath the physical brands or the currency is this idea of trust. It's this idea that when we rely on something, that we're trusting it, but it goes way beyond that too. It's not just the physical stuff either. It's actually our relationships. So think about it. Your family, like when you pick a spouse, somebody to be with, right, you're trusting that this is the sort of person that you could build a family with, that this would be the sort of relationship that you could actually build a life. So we make choices about what we buy, about our families, and they're all built on trust because we trust that by engaging in the world in these ways that we're going to experience the best life possible, right? That's why you make the choices that you do. But it goes even deeper than that. Think about it. It goes as deep as the worldview that you have. In fact, I would say that the reason that you shop at a particular store like why you would go to a particular department store, for example, or you would buy a particular brand of car, it actually has to do with something about your worldview. It has to do with something about the way you see the world. Like when you look at me, what type of car do you think I like? Subaru, of course. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, guys, you guys know that, right? You can just kind of tell because it's like the beliefs that we operate with, right? It tells us what's ultimately true. So many of us, we face frustrations and limitations about the stuff in our life. Like me, my frustrations with my Fuji Palisade, very frustrating. I'm frustrating, frustrated about it all the time. Or we might be frustrated about the government. We might be frustrated about the systems of our world. But you're not actually frustrated about those things. I'm frustrated that somebody back in the 90s sat down in a Fuji office and decided to make such a heavy bike. You get what I'm saying? There's actually an idea behind the thing that you trust or the thing that you're frustrated with. Those ideas give birth to these things. And, and that's the actual key to understanding why most of us feel frustrated about so many things most of the time. So if you could pinpoint, if you could pinpoint the detail of your worldview, like what's fueling your worldview? Where did it come from? You could start to ask the question, like, why do I trust the people and the things that I trust? What is my trust built on? What are those fundamental philosophies that fuel all of these important aspects of my life? Because those things, if you could figure out those things, you could actually figure out the key to your whole life. Oftentimes, we just, all we know is the feelings and the emotions that we have from the life that we're experiencing. But we never step back and recognize that our experience of life actually is downstream from these somewhat hidden worldviews that we surround ourselves with. And all we know is that we just, we just feel let down. We just feel let down in life, and we can't really ever pinpoint why. But I would say that it's actually possible to pinpoint why. It's possible to pinpoint why. It's possible to examine what is beneath our way of life and to see the fruit of it for what it is. And this is what Paul had in mind when he was writing the book of Colossians. So I'm going to invite you to open up the book of Colossians. We are in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, we're going to read verses 6 through 15. Verses 6 and 7 are kind of actually like a focal point of this whole section of the book of Colossians. So we're going to end with that. We're going to start in verse 8, and then we'll come back to it. So read with me here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says this. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. There it is. It's popping up right away. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Now, if you've been with us this summer, journeying with us through the book of Colossians, you, you've probably picked up on what Paul wants you to know more than anything, and that it's, he, he wants you to be full, right? He wants you to be full. He wants you to be complete 
but that we humans have a really big problem in trying to do that. It's that we think we know how to do it. We think we know how to do it, but we're hilariously bad at knowing how to do it, right? Uh, we, we, we're really bad at knowing what's actually going to make us a complete person. Uh, Jesus, Jesus often used this metaphor of a cup overflowing to talk about the inner life of a person who follows him. You guys remember when Jesus talks about it? It's like you'd have a spring of living water coming out of you. Paul here intentionally uses the opposite language to talk about trying to find fulfillment in anything other than Jesus. And that makes a lot of sense. If you think back to the middle of chapter 1 of Colossians, when we talked about how everything was made in Christ and through Christ and for Christ, it, it makes a lot of sense that you, you're never going to find fulfillment in something other than Christ, right? If he really is everything, it just doesn't make sense because Christ is the fabric of our reality. So Paul uses a word here in verse 8. He uses this word, hollow which it, it was an image. It represented in their day like the image of an empty vessel. So this is uh, an actual teacup that I own here. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful teacup. I mean, you guys, I paid $80 for this one teacup. Yes, I'm crazy. I'm a crazy person. It's, but it's gorgeous. It's handcrafted. It's like this beautiful cup. And, you know, it's beautiful on the outside. It's beautiful to look at, but, but it was made to be filled up with tea, right? Like, that's the whole point of it. And, and this is the image that Paul wants us to get in our heads, that there are philosophies and worldviews that we buy into that ultimately make us miserable. And Paul says it's like having a beautiful teacup that never provides any tea. It's hollow. It's empty. It's pointless. It's possible to believe in things that look and sound good on the outside, but they ultimately make you empty on the inside when you live by them. Have you experienced that before? It, not only are, are they empty and hollow, but he calls them deceptive. Now, now this word deceptive, deception, it, it has this different connotation. It has the idea of, of the bait and switch, right? Have you ever been caught in something that was like a bait and switch? How often do we see this in our world? There's so many great charities but then there's the charities that get the headlines because you give your money to, because you think you're helping out a good cause, but you later, you find out that the money was just being spent on like the elite people in the charity, right? It's being wasted. Um, it's not actually helping the people you thought it was going to help. And it's like this bait and switch situation, right? It's a deception. And you might be believing in deception, deceptive philosophies in your life without even knowing it. And the way to see it is if you repeatedly find yourself experiencing the emotion of these intense highs when you're participating in whatever that is, and then these immediate and sustained lows after the fact. If you find your life feels like that, it, it could be something that you're participating in that's actually deceptive. It could be something as simple as the food that you eat, right? The food, like, it tastes so good in the moment, but if it always leaves your body feeling like, Ugh, every time I eat that food, I just feel horrible, right? That is such a deceptive thing because it, it really just, it, it plays with our emotions. It tricked my senses into believing that it would be good, but it's not. It's deceptive. It's hollow. But, but worse yet, Paul says something strange. He, he says, he uses this word, he says that it takes you captive. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? It takes you captive. Now, this word that he uses in the Greek, it's, Silagogeo. Silagogeo. It's a military word, and it literally means like carrying off plunder, like capturing something and then carrying off plunder. And so what is Paul saying to this young group of Christians in the church of Colossae? He's saying, listen, you're following Jesus, and that's awesome, but there are so many tempting things in your town, so many tempting worldviews that you could be participating in. And, and the temptation was to take this newfound faith in Jesus and to mix it with something else, right? In, in fact, there's commentators who, as they have interpreted this passage, they've noticed that silagogeo is an extremely similar word to their word for synagogue. They're like, in fact, when I was even typing it in, in my Word document, it kept trying to autocorrect it to synagogue. And I just thought, I found that so funny. To the point where we think that Paul is actually making a pun here. He's saying, don't let 
yourself be carried off. Don't, don't let yourself become like a ransom, like be captured by this siligageo, right? He's saying, watch out. That old way of life where you're going to be asked to mix Jesus with religious actions or with those old Jewish customs in their day, and he's saying, you don't have to do it. He's saying, you don't have to do it. In fact, you should completely avoid it. Why? Because it's hollow, it's deceptive, and ultimately it will turn you into a prisoner who will be taken off. And you'll start finding yourself as collateral damage in your own life. Have you ever um, experienced yourself as collateral damage of your own decisions? Have you? Uh, for me, it was a couple years. It, and, I, and I'm being honest here. It actually has been a couple years now since this was a part of my life. But that, I'm just going to be totally honest this morning. Um, I kept finding myself at my old job. Um, I would go. I'd bike into work, right? Because I lived a little bit closer. Um, and I would find myself, it was just so easy to turn off and go to the grocery store and get two donuts. And I'm not here to donut shame because my wife and I eat pretty healthy. We both love donuts, okay? So that's my confession uh, that I'm going to make this morning. So I would just stop by and I'd get a couple donuts and I'd be like, no big deal, two bucks, couple donuts, it's all good. And um, I, you know, I, I didn't really need the donuts, but I, I shouldn't have been spending the money on them. Like we were on super tight budget and she'd be like, why are you going to the grocery store like to buy these $2 little purchases? And I didn't really want to talk about it, right? It was like, <laughs> Please don't ask me the question about the $1.98 purchase. Um, and it's just a small example because it, it's, it went from one day to like two days a week maybe, or maybe three days a week, or maybe it'd be a stressful week and all of a sudden it was like, well, maybe I'll just get a donut every day this week. Um, and I found myself um, just giving into this thing where by the end of it, I was like, I had the sugar high, but then I just felt pretty terrible the rest of the day, right? And, and that's just was my experience. It's just a small example of how this stuff works in our life. It wasn't the donut that was the problem, because again, they're great. It was the fact that it was this kind of secretive thing. Like, I didn't really want anyone else to know about it, because I like present myself as this healthy person, but I really wasn't all that healthy. I, I didn't want people to know. It sounds crazy, but have you ever been there with something? where you find yourself being taken captive by something that is like so powerful in your life. It was so alluring. Um, and I get done and I just feel terrible about it. But I think this is, that's just a small example of what Paul means when he starts talking about these elemental spiritual forces. We could literally do a semester class on what that, those elemental spiritual forces are. We're not going to. But here, in a simple way, let's put it this way. They're like base things in our lives, those base needs that we have, those basic things that we're drawn into that can be so deceptive, these deceptive philosophies that we tend to give into in our lives, and they play at our base needs, and then they do the bait and switch thing, and we become collateral damage. And it's so deceptive, it's so alluring, it's so hollow. It takes us captive, and it turns us into a prisoner. And, and for me, it was rooted in a belief. Now, now let's step back again. What was my, my desire with those donuts? It was rooted in a belief that I should just be able to eat whatever I want, whenever I want. That was the actual problem, right? The problem was that thought process. It was a philosophy in my head. It's a philosophy I still sometimes struggle with very often, that I should just be able to eat whatever I want, whenever I want, right? Because what do I really want? Is that what I really want? No. What I really want is to actually be full, like to actually be healthy, like to make decisions where I actually feel good at the end of the day in a life-sustaining kind of way. And I have a feeling that's what you want too. It might not be donuts for you. It might be something else. But you could, there's probably something in your mind where you're like, you know what? I, I actually want to be healthy. And so here's how you do it, says Paul. If you want to be full in a healthy way, why don't you follow the one who is full? Sounds kind of simple, right? Like, why, why not follow the one who's full? And he says this in verses 9 and 10. He says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. You see, the key, if you actually want to experience 
his fullness. It doesn't have something to do with you trying something new. It actually starts with you seeing who he is and then knowing who you are. So who is he? Well, what does it say? Like, why is he different than other worldviews? Why is Jesus different than some other competing worldview? Well, this is the actual beauty of who Jesus is. Paul says it. He's fully divine, and he's fully human. He's 100% divine, and he's 100% human. He says all the fullness of the deity is in him, but he was in a human body. And here's the reality. You and I, what we're looking for, not only are we looking for physical fullness, like something that can fill us up physically, we are looking for deep, spiritual, emotional, whole self fullness. We want to be satisfied on every level. And nowhere else, no other worldview, do you find this, this mixing of the spiritual and the physical like you do in Christ. Paul says he's fully God, but he's also fully human. And so now every action we take in the world or everything we do, it, it should, if we draw back to the philosophy behind it, it should draw its source from Jesus, right? At, at its base, we should be able to look at the, the motivations in our life and say they come from who Jesus is. In fact, I would suggest what we should do is we should filter our reality through Jesus. We should see our world through Jesus. We should ask whether the things we do or believe or the things that we buy into have their source in him. Because if they don't, we'll find ourselves continually dissatisfied Right? disillusioned with our lives, and, and we won't even know why. We won't be able to pinpoint why we're disillusioned and dissatisfied with our lives. So how do you do it? How do you do it? Well, I want to offer just a simple framework with the time we have remaining. I hope it's helpful for you. The framework uh, works like this, that we recognize the motivation or the pull beneath why we do what we do. You just try to figure out why are you doing what you're doing in trying to search for a full life. When you recognize those fundamental motivations in your life, then we can name them, like me with the donuts, right? Like that, that was a different motivation. And then we can choose a better path, the path of Jesus. So let's go. What would that first pull, what's the first way that we sometimes try to find fullness in our life? Well, Paul suggests in verse 11 what I'm going to call the pull of religious ceremony. He says this. He says, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision, not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now, circumcision, not a, a real popular topic on a Sunday morning in a church, right? But Paul is naming a fundamental religious ceremony, and he's questioning, and he's challenging the way that it was practiced in his day. Now, circumcision is just a cutting off of the foreskin, right? There we go. We got it out there. It was a Jewish rite. You're actually cutting off part of the body, right? But it was a marker. It, it actually showed that you were part of God's covenant family. And it's all over the Bible, right? It it's talked about all over the Bible. There's nothing wrong with that ceremony. But there was a false belief associated with people who had that marker. The false belief was, I'm good because I participate in some religious act. Like, I'm finding fullness because I participate in some religious act. Now, in our day, it might not be that. It, it could be fasting, right? You could be super proud. I've done fasting in my life. I've, I've been very, uh, you know, egotistical about it at times, where I feel like I'm doing something good. It could be Bible reading. It could be taking communion. It could be being baptized. All of these really good things, they're good things, but they fail. They fail as foundational worldviews on their own apart from Christ, right? The point of all those things is to point you back to Christ. That's the point. It's supposed to point you back to who Jesus is. So if you were to take it through the Jesus, the Christ filter, you might ask a question. You might say, do I love this ceremony more than I love Jesus? Do I love the ceremony more than I love Jesus? And it's a good question to ask when you sense that you're treating one of those things as the vehicle that will take you into fullness. Like, do I really love Jesus or have I made an idol out of some religious ceremonial act? Because the reality is that Paul is telling us that our identification with physical actions apart from Christ, it was put off. 
It was put off when we chose to follow Christ. Now, that word put off in the original language, it's a word with an image behind it. And you have to imagine wearing filthy clothes that you can't wait to like get off as quickly as possible because they're dirty and you want to get rid of them. So up at Fort Wilderness when I was growing up, we used to do this thing called the mud run. I don't know if anyone's done the mud run up there, but you'd get into clothes. Yeah, some of you definitely have. Uh, You get into clothes that you don't care about anymore, and you go with a bunch of friends, and you go through a, a swamp that's literally like waist deep, and you just have a huge mud fight with each other, right? And you throw at each other, and then you eventually you get all the way down this river that leads into the lake, and you try to wash off in the lake, and the guys go that way, and the girls go that way, and eventually what you ultimately do is you tear off your clothes, and you throw them away. You don't even try to rescue them anymore, right? You just like get, off, get rid of them. And that's the image behind what Paul is talking about here. He's saying you, you put it off. There's this pull in his day, there was a pull towards being a Christian and still needing to live by the rules of the old way of doing things, of Judaism. And Paul is saying that stuff was put off because of Jesus. Like, don't give into that pull anymore. Our second way of trying to find fullness apart from Christ, uh, we could call it the pull of tradition. So he says this in verses 12 and 13. He's going to talk about the tradition of baptism. He says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Now, that word baptism can mean several things, but one figurative meaning of baptism is literally to be identified with. So when you're baptized, you are identifying yourself with Jesus. Baptism in our day, it's often a marker that not only identifies you with Jesus, but oftentimes it it identifies you with a particular brand of Christianity in our day. You know what I mean? Like you were baptized into a specific church. So the reality for Paul was that your baptism identifies you with Christ. It means that you died with him and you're going to raise with him to new life as well. That's the truth behind baptism. But the pull for many of us, and it can be really subtle, it's the pull to over-identify our baptism with participation in a denomination or in a particular religious tradition. So we can fall into this false belief that our tradition is the right tradition and all other traditions don't mean anything. They're all wrong. It might sound like something as simple as this, and I just picked two random traditions, so don't take anything personally. I'm so glad that I'm Lutheran, and that I'm not a Catholic, right? That would be like the mentality behind something like this. Or, or maybe more generally, I'm so glad I'm a Christian and I'm not like those other people who aren't Christians, right? And Paul's saying, no, your baptism doesn't make you better than other people. It identifies you with Jesus, which is a huge, huge deal, but it doesn't make you better than other people. It doesn't make you full because you're now in some like elite spiritual club It makes you full because you're in Jesus, and he's the one who's full. Does that make sense? Like, that's why your baptism matters. So if you were to take this sort of mentality through a Christ filter now, you might ask yourself the question, does my identification to anything of this world matter to me more than my identification with Jesus? It's a great question to ask. Paul is saying, don't get a big head. You, you are dead. And Christ made you alive. It was his work. Don't get a big head about yourself. This Christ filter reorients us back to identify with Jesus above all else. The third way we might try to find fullness on our own terms, uh, we could call it the pull of our actions. In verse 14, he says, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, each of us has this pull to over-identify with our good or our bad actions. So the false belief that we might buy into with it is to say something like, I find fulfillment because I've got my act together. Like, I'm a full person because I've got my act together. Or just the opposite. Like, I'll never amount to anything. Look at all the horrible things that I've done. If you find yourself starting to say those things— you might be giving in to this pull of your action. And yet, what's the true reality? All the good things you could do 
what do they really amount to compared to Jesus, right? And, and what's, what's the other reality? All your mistakes? This is what Paul calls our legal indebtedness. What is it? It was nailed to the cross. It was taken care of. And there's an image here. This is legal terminology. It's the idea of having these handwritten certificates of debt in their day, and then somebody coming and blotting it out. That's the idea of what happened to your sin, your brokenness. It was taken care of by Jesus at the cross. And what a relief, right? All that kind of like stress that you hold on to because like of the things that I've done. This is a relief when you realize it was blotted out. It was nailed to the cross. And knowing that this is the case, it totally destroys our pull towards believing that our actions make, either make us this great person or this horrible person. Uh, that God could never love me because of my mistakes. In other words, the cross, it introduces us to God's grace, to his grace, to this free, uninhibited, sheer grace of God. And so the Christ filter, it might ask, does the value, the worth, the meaning of my life come from what I've done or from Christ alone? It does it come from what I've been doing or from Christ alone? And so maybe, maybe you feel the pull towards some religious ceremony or some religious tradition or a pull towards your actions, towards hyper-focusing on how good you are or how bad you are. Or maybe this morning there's an even more subtle, deceptive way that you try to find fullness in your life. And it's what I'm going to call the pull of relativism. Paul says this in verse 15. He says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see, there's a reason why fullness is found in Jesus and in no one else. There, there's a reason. The reason why is that he disarmed all of the spiritual powers that influence every worldview and philosophy in their world and in our world today. You see, there's actually only one truth. All truth comes from God, right? All truth comes from Jesus. It should be painfully obvious at this point in the book of Colossians that it's Christ himself. He's everything. He is truth. He is truth itself. And, and the cross put us in line with the truth and reality of God, but it did something else too. And you might not think about it this often because scripture points to these spiritual powers which influence every worldview and philosophy in our world that stands against Christ. But Jesus did something dramatic on the cross. You know, back in verse 8, when it talks about how we were taken captive— well, here, Jesus is the one taking all of those worldviews and those powers captive. He uses, uh, Paul uses a military metaphor. It's the image of Christ's death and resurrection making a public spectacle of these very same powers. So in that day, what they would do is the emperor, when they would conquer some new territory or some new land, is that they would take the king that they captured and they would take the warriors that they captured and they'd put them in chains, and they'd take them right through the center of town so that everybody could see that they were they're conquered, and they would take them on their way to execution, and everybody would watch this happen. Isn't that intense? That's the image that Paul is using here when he talks about what Jesus did on the cross for you. This is what he wants us to imagine, that every worldview and philosophy and the powers behind them, that they all can't simultaneously be true. It's not all relative. In other words, Jesus didn't die and rise again and say, it, it's all good, you guys. Like, go believe what you want and do what you want, and I'm sure it'll all work out in the end. Like, does that sound like what Jesus did on the cross? No, he says your beliefs and your actions and your decisions that you make with your life, they're important. They matter. They have a profound influence to either chain you up or to set you free. You see that? Like, so which one do you want? Because we all have, to some degree, the, this pull. Like, we want to be, have this pull towards relativism in our day, which, which really just says that I can find and I can define fullness on my own terms. I can just do it on my own. And the Christ filter would challenge us to ask ourselves. He would say, does my worldview look like Jesus? Or does my Jesus look like my worldview? 
That's a great question for us to ask ourselves this morning. So you should notice something. As you start to ask yourselves these questions, take your life through these Christ filters that they keep pointing you back to him. They get you out of your own head, out of your own thinking, and they point you back to Christ himself. It helps you to see and to name deception for what it is. It's a huge letdown. When you believe deception, it's, it's a huge letdown. To live your life believing that I, like, I'm good because I'm religious, or I'm good because I'm a part of a tradition, or, I, or I'm a great person because of what I do, or I'm a terrible person, or I can handle life on my own. Doesn't that just sound like a letdown? It sounds exhausting. You guys, believing and allowing these false beliefs to run in the background of your life, it's a letdown, but it is so much worse than that. It's dangerous. It's dangerous, but knowing who Jesus is, that you are in him, that you identify with him, and not with any of this other stuff, it shows you that Jesus will never let you down. So I'm going to end quickly just by drawing you back to verses 6 and 7. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Paul gives us four quick metaphors, and here's my, my invitation to you this morning. Just listen to these and pick one. Which one is God speaking to you this morning? He, he talks about being like a tree. He says being rooted, and, and I love that metaphor because roots keep growing, and maybe God is calling you this morning to keep growing. Maybe that's what you're feeling this morning as you hear these words that he is sharing with us. He he wants us also to be like a strong building with a deep foundation. It says being built up. Have you ever made a structure without a foundation? I used to make them all the time out in the woods. You come back a couple days later and they collapsed. So there's no foundation. And maybe this morning as you hear these words, what you're really sensing is God is asking me to go deeper and to have a strong foundation. He wants you to be a student. It says being strengthened in the faith. You know, some of us here today are susceptible to believing all kinds of stuff that will lead us in the wrong place simply because we're not great students of the Word of God. Like, we should be a lot stronger. And maybe you can feel a lack of strength, and there's actually a way to get strong. And it's not a mystery. And if you want to be like Jesus, you'll need to know that that all it is you can know about Him so that you can recognize Him more. Perhaps this morning God is inviting you to become a student of his again. Or maybe this morning he's asking you to be like a river. It says overflowing with thankfulness. You might have deep roots and a strong foundation. You're a student of the word, but you've been following Jesus for a long time. But maybe the challenge this morning is that you need to overflow. You think about like the Nile going through the desert. And you know what? The Nile is so great. It's great because it overflows and it feeds everything around it. And maybe God is asking you to be like a river overflowing to the people around you who need it most. So how is your life? Really, like how does it feel to live in your shoes this morning? Are you feeling full? You feeling complete? Or if you're honest with yourself, is it easy to get frustrated with your life and disillusioned and you wish there was a better way to live, to be the kind of stable follower of Jesus, the invitation this morning is for you to come and follow him.